Thank you, Ron. Uh, good morning, everybody. We are in for a real treat. Um, if you've never seen Dr. Inge give a talk before, um, her uh, enthusiasm is infectious. Uh, you can't you can't help but be excited to see the wonderful science um, and feel how excited she is for it as well. Uh, so um, Ying is a, a professor in the Department of Cell and Regenerative Biology and Chemistry at University of Wisconsin in Madison. And um, she uh, runs, she's a director of mass spectrometry in the human proteomics program. And she is really a rare breed as far as um, she has her feet in both worlds as a true um, physiologist and biologist, as well as a mass spectrometrist. And I'm sure that any of you who've worked with a mass spec core um, know that the mass spectrometrist is excited to give you just a really, really long spreadsheet with tons of information on it and not necessarily help you gain biological insight out of that. And because that, that connection of mass spectrometry to insight and mechanism is incredibly challenging. And nobody does it, in my opinion, better than uh, Yinge. And so I think this, this recent paper from her in JMCC is a, uh, a shining example of that. And uh, I am happy to, uh, to have her today and look forward to her talk. Okay. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for the very kind introduction. And thanks, Ron, for hosting this section and also I uh, like to give my, uh, you know, big thanks to the JMCC editor, editors, uh, Ron and Mike, for selecting our um, paper uh, as the editor of choice. It's uh, such a great honor. And to all of you on Zoom, you know, happy to meet you virtually. Um, so we also look forward to welcoming you all to Madison uh, for the ISHR. NARS, North American you know, Section Conference in June and in this beautiful city of Madison. So anyway, so um, today I'm going to share with you this paper uh, entitled Integrated Proteomics Reviews Alteration in Sarcomere Composition and Developmental Processes During Postnatal Swan Heart Development. And in addition, I also want to expand this in a full talk that as describe the research overall in our lab. So as Jonathan uh, mentioned, I uh, have very unique uh, career paths. I actually, I uh, was trained as a chemist and started learning cardiophysiology um, when, you know, at UW Madison. So, um, so I actually also have industry experience. I worked in drug discovery and uh, development prior. I uh, came back to uh, academia, so definitely very unusual career path. So in my lab, um, we really want to integrate chemistry with biology and the medicine. This is what I see when I work in pharma, that our chemists work with biologists, pharmacists, MDs to um, develop a drug. So uh, when I came back to academia, I have the same mind. I want to really train the students um, that they can much easier to um, land their future career. So I have a talented chemistry students delivered to these technology in proteomics, uh, metabolomics. I have also very talented, um, you know, students and postdocs in biology um, really utilize these freshly um, developed technologies to understand biological questions such as filament, metabolism, and the signaling. Uh, we also have MD, PhD students help us uh, co connect to the clinic. So we'll welcome all um, students with various backgrounds to our lab, regardless of your chemistry students, biology students, or MD students, you can have a family fit in our lab. So at this point, we are especially interested to recruit a biology poster. Um, so for those of you who has a biology training, if you are excited to learn omics, please come uh, to join my lab. So um, as many of you know, omics technology is really the enabling force for precision medicine. Uh, the power of omics technologies it can be used to decipher the networks and molecular complexity of biological systems towards precision medicine. 
can review at the molecular level, cellular level, and organ level. Uh, so my lab, as uh, you know, that focus on proteomics. Uh, we started to do some of metabolomics, but overall we want to integrate the proteomics with metabolomics with, um, you know, biochemical and physiological functions. So as many of you know that, uh, um, you know, proteome is very complex. So, you know, comparing to genome, uh, there are many more proteins in the proteome. This is because one gene can be alternately spliced into um, multiple MIAs, and there are all kinds of post-translational modifications. Patients that could occur to the proteins, such as phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation, glycosylation, ubiquination. So these modifications, they are not merely just, um, you know, decorations. They, they really regulate the protein activity and the function. So um, over time, we find that these modifications are so important, but of all very difficult to study. So we are just trying to see, uh, the, to convince you that we now have a great technology to help you study the post-translational modification that's a top-down proteomics. Uh, so overall, the uh, genome is static blueprint and proteome is dynamic real life building blocks. And also proteins work together um, like in the, interact in the interactome. So for those who are not very familiar with proteomics, I just give you a quick overview on the uh, two main proteomics technologies, one called uh, bottom-up and top-down. So in the bottom-up approach, which is a mainstream approach, the proteins get digested into peptide. So you analyze peptide instead of a whole protein. Um, so the, the advantage is once you cut the proteins to peptides, it's much easier to manage. So we can uh, do, you know, large scale protein identification, you know, uh, quantitation, and uh, also identify interactome. So this method is really cool, very robust, very um, reproducible right now uh, to show the global proteomics quantitation. Um, but the, the problem is that like, because you're cutting proteins into peptides, so not all peptides could be recovered. Thinking about in the proteome, you have millions of proteo, proteoforms. So um, in this case, we also suffer from potentially missing PTMs. So if you send your samples to a core or you get a few peptides represent your protein, so you may or may not find the PTM on the residue that you are looking for. And so on the other hand, we can do um, top-down proteomics, which essentially analyze the whole proteins without digestion. So this way you can you know, really see the full picture of the whole protein. And then we always call it like, you, you really see the elephant rather than touch pieces of elephant. So you can see, you know, whether your proteins are acetylated, phosphorylated, you have truncations, et cetera. And then we analyze all the protein, the entire proteins directly in the mass spectrometer. You can obtain very high accuracy mass measurement. And uh, um, for, you know, for, to identify the protein, we do tenor mass spectrometry. So it's like do DNA sequencing. You know, you you can kind of sequence each amino acid, then find a protein ID. You can do also do quantitation and um, PTM mapping. So certainly, this is a much um, reliable way to map a post-translation pro, pro modifications because you essentially has 100% coverage of the sequence. But currently, um, the technology is still evolving because of challenges in protein solubility, separation, detection, and data analysis. So it's this is more like upcoming technology and um, uh, relatively newer, um, the uh, bottom map is much more mature. So in our lab, we recognize um, the strengths of both uh, approaches and try to integrate them uh, to address cardiac biological questions. So um, top-down proteomics is uh, what I'm expert with. So I'm going to tell you how this actually works. So we said it's called a characterizing proteoform. So proteoform is a new term that we use to define all protein products from the same gene, but maybe different alternate splicing isoforms or you know mutations. So this is a really cool technology to study, especially um, genetic inherited disease, which things cause them a mutation. 
So remember, you always find that mutations. Some mutations cause disease, some mutations don't, and even same mutation, they may be different outcome. So this technology, top-down proteomics, can help us to understand how mutations affect post-translational modifications, alternative splicings, and function. So I'm trying to actually show you uh, what the data looks like in top-down proteomics, okay? So um, I take example of troponin I, my uh, favorite molecule. Um, so the troponin I, you know, when you get a very pure troponin I like this, you, you'd be pretty happy. But when you look at this protein in the um, high resolution mass spectrometry, there's so many different forms. So you wonder, oh, is this pure? Um, don't get a heart attack. They are all the troponin eyes, it's just different modification because high resolution. So you can have high mass accuracy and we can identify all the uh, post translational modifications. So this this piece here, this peak here is a satellited um, full length protein. This is phosphorylation because it has 80 Dalton mass differences. So in mass spectrometry, we, we are mass coded, right? Each mass coding is, uh, um, you know, give you a different kind of a modification changes. For example, if we phosphorylation will add 80 Dalton, okay? So oxidation, this will add 16 Dalton. And you could also see the mass loss, uh, the Dalton loss, like this 216 is coding for two amino acid loss, right? So of E and S, um, so you can have, this is two amino acid loss, this 147 is uh, phenylalanine, and uh, the 128 can be Q or, you know, um, a lysine. So you can see this three amino acid, four amino acid loss. So overall, you can see, See, there are 30 different proteoform observed from a single gene product because of these, um, we call them um, PTM codes. You have these different PTM, they can have different permutations. So uh, use analogy. In the traditional technologies, uh, what you see is uh, sim you know, simplified. You think of the proteins in the terms of meta modification. Uh, so now with these ultra high resolution mass spectrometry, we call this as like molecular, um, you know, microscope. The, that help you to reveal the hidden iceberg, which is essentially the PTM code, right? Also, we have ultra high resolution that brings us with ultra mass accuracy. We can even distinguish uh, the differences between acetylation and trismethylation. Uh, which is only 0.036 Dalton mass differences. It's super accurate. accurate. So with this uh, uh, high mass accuracy, so my former um, biology student, Zach Gregwick, he has shown nicely example in the heart. So this protein regulated light chain, many of you know. Um, so when it expressed the age here, we find it has acetylation in, in terminal. When it is first in the ventricle, it has trimethylation. Okay, so um, luckily we also published a paper in GMCC. GMCC is one of our favorite journal um, for publication. I uh, definitely recommend everybody to publish in GMCC. Okay, so um, in our lab, it will always try to utilize these technologies to study heart failure. So we try to utilize um, large animal models in the cl clinical samples to that. Heart failures, it's clinical and translational approach. We're very interested in the early stage, how you know the start onset of the heart disease. Um, so our focus, of course, is on the sarcomere. Um, you know, um, it's it's a it's a contractile apparatus is so important in uh, contraction and relaxation. So the cardiac system is the first system I enter, you know, get to, to, to know when I start cardiac biology and I, I really fall in love with it. And uh, I think uh, we have a very strong malfilament sarcomere community and uh, it's, a, it's a, such a welcoming community and I really appreciate their support. Um, so as many of you know, at, in the sarcomere, we have the uh, malfilament, the Thin filament, troponins, tropomyosins, and actin, and a thick filament, you have the, uh, you know, myosin, mycin, heavy chain, light chain, mycin binding protein C, 
And also, uh, don't forget about Z-Disc. Z-Disc uh, is also part of the Sacomia. We find one more interesting story um, uh, actually in the Z-Disc proteins. So overall, we try to integrate proteomics uh, with phenotype of function. So in the past decades, we have uh, tried to develop these uh, top-down LCMS-based quantitative proteomics for understanding proteo for biology and, and to use that for precision medicine. So we take the tissues. We don't need a whole heart right now. We actually only need uh, one to five milligram of tissues. And also we can apply this to iPS cells. So we uh, even recently we can apply to single cells. So small amount of samples needed. We do tissue homogenization and protein extraction. So many of the old, old previous established biochemical technology still works. We can separate them. This is actually we take uh, from Jenny Van Eyck's in sequence um, protein extraction so that we can first extract the soluble proteins, second extraction using TFA so we can enrich the monofilament to sacramia proteins, and the third extraction as more of a like Mod, you know, membrane proteins, insoluble ECM proteins. Now we have a new surfactant called azo to help out. Uh, so we mainly focus on sarcomia, so we can take the sarcomia extractions, but if you are interested in membrane proteins, uh, soluble proteins, you can also use other fractions as well. So we use the chromatography separation. So you can separate each proteins on the LCMS scale. Uh, if you only like sarcomia, we can actually do the one-dimensional chromatography. But if you want to expand the whole proteome, you do multi-dimensional chromatography that help you to um, achieve in the depths of uh, the proteome form. So we can do online LCMS rapid profiling. So each protein, when they elute, we at the same time, we can record a mass spectrum. Okay. So um, because mass spectrometry is very sensitive, so we actually don't need utilize all the samples and sometimes it can collect fractions. You can, uh, these are pure endogenous proteins. You can do detailed characterization, tender mass spectrometry. You can also use this for activity assay and functional uh, measurement. So overall it can correlate the proteoform with disease. So I just want to highlight one of the very early study. We have this, the SWAN acute myocardial infarction to mimic human heart attack, we use left anterior descending aorta 90 minutes to for occlusion. And the long story short, after a uh, you know um, glo uh, uh, kind of top down proteomic analysis, uh, many proteins we don't see change, but there are proteins that we see change. So this is a cardiac troponin eye. This is sort of expected as giving the importance of uh, cardiac troponin eye in uh, contractility. And there's the phosphorylation. This actually, uh, certain 22, 23 is known to regulate relaxation. And we find actually a no protein. So that time, um, you know, my <laughs> colleagues here, G GR, who's a kind of physiologist, oh, so maybe it's a troponin eye related protein. And when we take a look at the mass spectrometry, uh, it's a 25 kilodelta and due to MSMS, we found this actually is ending about homolog. It's not the troponin I related, right? So this is the beauty of top down that allows you to discover new, um, you know, targets that potentially you you actually not in your prediction. So uh, in this way, we we find you know this actually is this consolidated regulation between troponin I in the thin filament, mycin light chain two in thick filament, and also ENH two in the Z disk. So going forward with this uh, interesting uh, finding, we see um, so together you know collaborating with Professor J. E. Zhang in UAB. We we find actually a similar you know they reproduce a similar. Um, kind of, uh, you know, um, like decrease of phosphorylation in the NH2 and the troponin I. And Zach Greg Wick, as you know, my student again, work on this project. He found after the stem cell treatment, which was done in Jay's lab, in the mass spec down in our lab, we find um, these MI-induced proteoform alteration actually can be reversed by the stem cell therapy. It's, and I want to also alert you the mass accuracy. You can see we have very high mass accuracy with the 
like PPM range. So we are very confident about the proteins. We actually don't really need to do Western blot. We actually have much more accuracy and the specificity than Western blot and high reproducibility. Of course, um, you know, um, you know, nobody wants to go open chest surgery and get transplantation of those iPS cells. So many labs are now interested in the endogenous cardiac regeneration. So in in you know working with uh, Jay Jay and Wook, so uh, that we are actually trying to understand, um, you know what's underlying the mechanism in these endogenous uh, regeneration as uh, they previously published in the circulation research, a uh, circulation journal, and uh, that the uh, regeneration potential of the neonatal um, swan hearts, but this regeneration potential get lost when um, you know the uh, the animals actually grows up. So we try to understand what's going on in this development stage, right? So what happens in in this. Um, mechanisms in these neonatal to postnatal development that cause a loss of this regeneration potential. So uh, now I focus on this paper, uh, which uh, uh, the first author is uh, my um, graduate student, uh, Timothy Abalo, who is a MCP, Molecular and Cellular Pharmacology trainee. And uh, so in collaboration uh, with Professor Jay Yi Zhang and, uh, um, you know, Uk, and, uh, you know, my colleague here, Ahmed Memma, and many of the co-authors here. So uh, in this study, um, Timothy has, you know, elegantly studied the S1 uh, heart pro proteomics, and uh, then we show uh, many in interesting findings here in both the sarcomere uh, composition and also uh, developmental and metabolic processes during this postnatal swan heart development. So I'm um, going to get in a little bit more details about this paper. So first, we use top-down proteomics to um, study the sarcomere. So we have this group of uh, swans, uh, P0, which has regeneration potential, P7 and the P28 to P56, of course, gradually loss of regeneration potential. So we use a TSTF, TFA extraction to enrich the sarcomere and using the uh, broker instrument, uh, you put a top-down LC-MS-MS uh, identification and quantitation. Uh, so we didn't use only the L, uh, left ventricle samples in this. We did not use whole heart, just a piece of uh, samples. Um, on the same time, we also do global proteomics that using uh, azole, which is a surfactant we recently developed that can allow us to solubilize the proteins. So this global proteomics, that we try to reach uh, pro proteome beyond um, the sarcomere, it's just in addition to what we see in the sarcomere, what do we, the, so these two methods are complementary. Anyway, for the top-down proteomics part, um, we use this uh, LCMS approach so that we can use separate the uh, um, individual uh, sarcomere proteins very nicely on this 30, 35 minutes um, assay. And you can see these are overlay of a different experiments. Quite reproducible. So, we use this platform, we were able to reproduce liberally, separate, and identify uh, these key sarcomere proteoforms. So, this slide showed that top down proteomics is truly quantitative, and we actually have very robust quantitation. So similarly, as you do Western blot, we can do the this the linear. You can see these <laughs> as uh, well, Timothy has exceptional uh, hand skills. And you can see this very linear response that we can get for this top-down proteomics. So, uh, in, so we, we got this robust chromatography and linear MS signal intensity provided confidence in our downstream quantitative analysis. Uh, and you can see this quantitative analysis instrument response produced a square of 0.98 for all proteoform of interest. So by looking at this data, you wonder, you know, really this is is, is uh, uh, equivalent to you do probably um, many Western blasts simultaneously 
except we have extremely high uh, throughput, high sensitivity, and high resolution. So over the time, we have to convince the community. Once we could do this top-down proteomic study in type protein approaches, we actually, you don't need to use Western blot uh, to validate. And we don't need a Western blot. <laughs> so use mass spectrometry, you can identify all of the proteins. So um, Timothy has down, you know, kind of profiles all the uh, malfilament proteins. So particularly proteins uh, of interest, they actually change during this development processes. So in the top down, I want to say it's very, um, you know, visual. So like this protein, this peak here, it's alpha tropomyosin. This peak here is corresponding to AD Dalton addition. This is a phosphorylated alpha tropomyosin. You also can see, oh, this is a beta tropomyosin. So they all show up in the same spectrum. You can quantitate them simultaneously. Unlike Western blood, you have to use antibody, one for each of the forms. In mass spectrometry, we can get all these information in this 30, 35 minutes wrong, okay, with uh, like hundreds of these proteoform uh, quantitation. So we have shown that sarcomere maturation is associated with decreased phosphorylation of tropomyosin. And we'll also see there is a decreased expression of this immature tropotin T, which is very interesting. So again, you know, we actually can see this post-translational modifications together with isoform in the same um, mass spectrometry. So in this case here, we see troponin T, isoform one, isoform two, isoform um, actually three. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you also see the isoform one has phosphorylation, isoform two also has phosphorylation, and isoform three also has phosphorylation. So it's just really um, very powerful technology to study post-translational modification and isoforms together. <laughs> so also, uh, you know, look at other uh, proteins. Everybody know this low skeletal muscle troponin I is sort of a uh, uh, you know, marker for maturation. So the largest changes we see in the sarcomere is still this uh, isoform switch uh, throughout postnatal is this uh, slow skeletal um, troponin isoform to the cardiac uh, troponin isoform. So you see it dominating uh, slow skeletal muscle troponin I in the P, P uh, day one and uh, it starts to decrease in day seven and uh, almost um, you know, uh, kind of a disappear, uh, started, to, you know, in later stage, like 50, 50, 60 days. We also see other detected isoforms like mycine, like chain 1A to mycine, uh, like chain 1V and mycine like chain 2A to mycine like chain 2V and as well as alpha cardiac uh, actin to uh, alpha slow ske uh, skeletal actin, so which, is kind of consistent with um, with our hypothesis in the literature. Um, so, you know, as we talked about top-down proteomics uh, right now, as um, you kind of use, we have the method ready for sarcomere. So we also integrated the bottom-up proteomics because it's very quick approach that, uh, you know, uh, by analyzing these peptides, we actually can get uh, thousands of proteins simultaneously. With the top down, we're looking more of a less than 100 proteins, usually 20 to 30. Um, Sometimes we can get uh, 50 to 60 um, proteins, but we have a lot more uh, proteoforms. Uh, using this global proteomics, we also uh, showing you high reproducibility. So again, um, I'm very confident about you know Timothy's skills. He really has a exceptional data uh, quality. So we use this global bottom up proteomics that we actually identify four thousand proteins per group. So this actually shows this re re reduced proteome complexity over time uh, and likely um, because of the, uh, you know, mature protein uh, forms. Uh, so there are these uh, upset analysis demonstrate there's a core proteome common to all, um, you know, samples. We also see using this uh, 
robust PC clustering, the samples are separated by time. We obviously see different grouping and for these different day, um, development stage. So this global um, bottom map data shows us uh, with this volcano plot that we compare different uh, postnatal stage that day one, day seven, day one to the day 28 and uh, you know day one to day 50. Six. So overall, we see increasing number of differentially expressed protein over time. And day one has this um, 550, uh, 87 proteins with high expression when compared with uh, day um, 56, the proteome compaction over time. We also see uh, the reduced expression of uh, the uh, slow skeletal uh, troponin I and mycin light chain 1A to A over time, which has, uh, agrees beautifully with the top down data. So, top down and bottom up are consistent um, in, 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 in this case. And um, using you know, hierarchy clustering, we can um, clearly see these 4,000 proteins. They have two categories that they have overall they are decreased throughout develop one group is decreased throughout development and one group is actually increased in development okay so for the for the protein group decrease in uh, development using this gene ontology analysis which Timothy performed we have shown there's um hard development uh, uh kind of muscle tissues and you know um muscle uh, cell development, my fiber assembly and the sagamere uh, organization, uh, the ARSH increased over um, the postnatal development. And on the other hand, we see uh, proteins involved in metabolic processes. You see lots of metabolic processes, um, including maturation, metabolic processes. Uh, they actually decrease uh, during this uh, development stage. So to look, look into each protein, again, very quantitative method. We use this label free quantitation and uh, Timothy has nicely showed these uh, very, very good qu quality data. Uh, so those proteins involved in kind of development and proliferation and maturation, we see uh, these proteins that changes. The, for example, the sticky K9, ME52C, IBM3, and the SMART3, they actually show decrease in the development. And there are also other proteins like CDK2C, and FAB3, and uh, uh, these other proteins, they show overall uh, increase in the development. So in summary of the study, uh, for this postnatal swan heart proteomics that we have shown you, we'll be able to perform this comprehensive proteomic landscape of postnatal swan heart development. Uh, using the top-down proteomics, we reviewed multiple sacmeric isoform switches during uh, maturation. I show a uh, global proteomics uncovered developmental and metabolic changes in swan hearts. And there's over 700 differentially expressed protein identified during uh, the postnatal uh, development. Overall, we have shown you this integrated proteomics review alteration in sacramental composition developmental processes during this postnatal swan heart development. Of course, this is just starting of this work, um, this uh, uh, short communication um, that we're going to follow up with more of a, um, you know, understanding at the molecular and the functional level. You know, so we try to um, next to apply to see in the in the kind of regeneration um, uh, and, and review the mechanism through this um, integrated proteomics approach in, and also system biology approach. OK, so now I have I think I have extra time. <laughs> so I'm going to talk uh, to you a little bit about other work that we have um, down in the lab. So remember, we our goal is to translate uh, what we learn a lot animals to the clinic to the clinic. So obviously we trying to see what it, what's going on in the you know in, in the herd proteome, right? In the human samples. 
So luckily, in collaboration with um, Paul Tan from University of Michigan, we obtained this um, uh, ICM tissue samples uh, from LVAD surgery, left, uh, um, you know, um, left any assisted device, uh, in, you know, installation, we actually usually get these uh, samples from LVAD surgery. So we take this, we focus on sarcomere in this case, we can do sarcomeric extraction and we do the online separation and then we can see, uh, you know, proteoform changes. So uh, many of you know that uh, these are the three major <laughs> cardiomyopathies in the heart, ICM, uh, HCM, and DCM. So uh, in this case, my student, Emily Chapman, um, actually separated these sarcomere proteins really beautifully uh, in this 1D uh, LCMS. So again, this is about 35 minutes separation. She can separate MLP, quiz two. <laughs> these are... Uh, Zetus proteins. We see lots of Zetus proteins now in H2, ciphers, uh, FHL, uh, calcelsin, you know, and of, co uh, of course to the monofilament proteins, the troponin I, troponin T, tropomyosin, mycin lichen, and, you know, YV, YA, 2V. I mean, it just essentially you can get these proteins all separated in 1D LCMS at the same time. You, you know, we, we can collect um, the uh, proteoform. Again, this is all automated processes. The instrument run 24 seven. You put the samples in and all the information you could have. Um, so in here, we can see there's lots of different um, proteoforms like mycin, like chain, uh, I mean, sorry, <laughs> muscle line protein, MLP. Um, you can see phosphorylation, quip, Two, it has phosphorylation. So, um, you know, calcium, we have seen multiple um, modifications as well. Okay, so she have shown that um, there is a, a also decrease of phosphorylation in these ICM tissues. So remember we have 16 donor and 16 ICM. These, these are just representation. So for those of you not very familiar with um, uh, with mass spec, you can see this actual peak represented the doubly phosphorylated troponin I, the singly phosphorylated, this unphosphorylated. So when you see unphosphorylated peak rise up, that means your phosphorylation decreases. Okay, of course we have the we have the program here to help you to actually can you can see the total uh, number of phosphorylation of troponin I is a decrease in the ICM tissue comparison to the donor. And interestingly for NH2 that we have shown that it's also decreased phosphorylation. Similarly, as we observe in the um, human samples. Okay. So um, interesting is NH2 and troponin IC has this, similarly as we see in the pig, they have this coordinated, um, you know, decrease of phosphorylation. Uh, in addition to the phosphorylation, we also see um, isoform changes. Uh, such as this uh, alpha skeletal muscle, uh, alpha skeletal actin, and uh, the overall the increase of skeletal muscle um, uh, actin in the ICM uh, versus the in the donor heart. And this again, the top down we actually can see lots of uh, you know details in the uh, uh, isoforms expression. Like this is a. Uh, uh, alpha tropomyosin in humans, we see gamma and the kappa tropomyosin in there. And also this is local beta tropomyosin. You see them all in bird's eye view. So um, we actually also have over the time, we have um, studied, um, you know, the another <laughs> in, inherited disease. Remember we say it, it's, it's so this is actually an interesting story. When I was visit, you know, I love my seminar visits. So I learned a lot from my um, my colleagues um, and friends in cardiovascular community. So they said, "Oh, you know, you have this so wonderful, powerful tool to study sarcomere. It's a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a disease of sarcomere, so it's a really good to study." 
So we have over 1,400 HCM mutations identified at least 11 genes, the majority in cold succulent proteins, as you know. So, um, but it has been a really difficult problem for cardiologists. Uh, once I met, um, you know, Joe Tardif, she mentioned that, you know, it's, it's really difficult to treat patients because the mutation not necessarily um, predicting the prognosis. Um, some mutations, the same family, they could lead to different outcomes. And as again, with some mutations associated with a relative benign clinical course, um, but other uh, mutations can lead to sudden death. And the, the big puzzle is, you know, patients with same mutations can exhibit dr drastically different disease severity and a clinical outcome. So we are hoping to use proteomics to sort of, um, you know, review some insights in there to help understand what, you know, to bridge between the, the genotype and the phenotype, okay? So uh, luckily in collaboration um, with uh, many of the uh, cardiologists and physiologists and the surgeons, so we received these samples from uh, septomalctomy uh, surgery. So uh, as you know, these uh, obstructive HCM patients um, over the time, the the kind of uh, you know the tissue thickens and block the the blood flow. So the surgeons need to uh, take them out by this septomalctomy surgery. So uh, we, then we receive samples. So some of the samples of uh, we received from locally and some that we received from uh, Steve Marston from the UK and also Chris uh, Demios and Amy Lee from Austria has provided us samples. So we're very appreciated as a global, uh, co you know, really a collaboration. We can, again, use the similar method to separate the filament and ZDX proteins on the LC mode and then look at the proteoform. So again, we are ha we now able to really recover, um, you know, most, I mean, identify most of the sarcomere proteins uh, in the thin filament, the thick filament, and also Z disk. Uh, we had nicely, again, nicely separated all the all of them uh, in the equipmentography. So uh, I, I think when I first write my own one, I think uh, you know some <laughs> reviewers did you not quite think that's possible. But over the years, we have shown the technology development, and um, the, it convinced the reviewers that. You know, it is totally possible. Again, it's equivalent to do, um, you know, many uh, Western blots, and but of course, in the Western blot, you don't even have very highly specific uh, these antibodies for PTMs. So, but we can do this without any um, antibody. You do LCMS and for quantitation. Uh, so, just quickly to show that we do have a bird's eye view to show isoform together with PTMs. Uh, in this case, we still still see a Chaponi I in H2 in the HCM. But more excitingly, we actually find, you know, the mutation, although there are different mutations, but because they presented to um, the clinic with similar phenotype, we see the proteoform type, they actually converge, unlike originally we thought, they, you know, essentially as different. So this data actually suggests a common paths were activated, possibly similar clinical phenotype HCM. Uh, patient regardless of the HCM causing mutations. So this actually gave the clinicians of uh, new insights that you, you now have to treat patients at the, you know, each as the individual um, genome editing, but there may be some drugs that can be used for patients present to similar uh, phenotypes. And also we, we, we send a top down. The top is intact protein measurement and down is fragmentation. So we can fragment the proteins in the gas phase in the mass spectrometer. This allows us to identify the size of modification, the mutations, alternatives, uh, splicing isoforms, et cetera. And we have find very exciting thing is like, these, uh, you know, same phosphorylation sites for both these troponin I and the NH2. This uh, supports uh, the, 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 you know, Swan heart failure model is indeed a great model. So that, uh, my uh, collaborator Jay is very happy to see results. We actually also are very happy that our hypothesis that the Swan model is a good translational model uh, for, um, you know, study heart failure. Okay, so um, we talked a lot about one-dimensional equipmentography. So one of the uh, problem of one-dimensional equipmentography is only you see lots of smaller 
molecular weight species. So unlike uh, gels, I mean like mass spec has a bias against large proteins. So when you have small protein together with large proteins, we cannot see the small um, large proteins. So we have used the size exclusion to separate the large proteins from small proteins. So this way we can identify mycin heavy chain, mycin binding protein C. Uh, yeah, we increase you know, the identification of all the sarcomere proteins, not yet to tighten. It's a very big protein. <laughs> Um, so, of course, um, you know, heart tissue, right? We very difficult to get heart tissue. So we also take another different, you know, approach, thanks to uh, my colleagues, um, Tim Camp, you know, Kurt Ravi, Josh Hermsen, who's a surgeon, and many thanks to Joe Wu, who provided the, um, the, the IPSL uh, lines from the HCM patients. So we actually to differentiate in cardiomyocytes and um, report you know, you know, do in, in 3D engineered cardiac tissue by Carter's lab and in Tim's lab measure electrophysiology our lab to proteomics. We have shown you that, you know, um, top down works for um, IPSL by cardiomyocytes and we can uh, quantify the isoforms and the PTMs. And this way we actually can show top down show very easy, robust uh, method for measure maturation. As you know, this is maturation is a common problem. So we can find these maturation markers easily. And if you, know, if you want to see how mature your, the cells are, we can really do quickly. At the same time, we also see PTM changes and novel marker for the maturation. So I'm just rushing through because time is up. <laughs> so. Um, and uh, we also showed that recently my um, uh, graduate student, Jake Malby, he has shown that we can integrate the proteomics with function. So for the same sample, this is actually the ECT we made um, by IPSL direct cardiomyocyte size and a fibroblast. Uh, we can measure the function first. This is a collaboration with um, Carter Rolfi and um, Toy Derange and it was also Tim Camp. So we, we can measure the proteins after uh, the functional uh, measurement and does not change the proteome form. So this allows you better integrate prote proteomics with mechanical properties. And then moving forward, um, student Jake actually um, develop this high sensitivity uh, top-down proteomics uh, platform for single muscle cell uh, analysis that we, you know, in Jake's hand, he can use a microscope to, uh, to isolate these muscle cells and then actually uh, measure the function as well as the proteomics. So uh, Jake just graduated before his graduation, the paper got accepted by PNAS. Um, so, Overall, so we have shown this, um, you know, we try to decode the human heart proteome by top-down um, proteomics. So we're focusing on sarcomere right now, but there are um, other proteins, some people, you know, the interested receptors, the kinases, and the phosphatases, and um, calcium handle proteins. As we know, these membrane proteins traditionally would be very difficult because they need, um, you know, um, surfactant and surfactant like SDS that, really uh, is a very um, big problem for mass spec. So once we have SDS, we cannot solve, uh, we cannot actually measure the proteins uh, because SDS really dominate the, uh, the mass spectrometer uh, signal. So we have to develop this photocleaver surfactant that has engineered a cleaver bond between the hydrophobic, hydrophobic um, tail and hydrophilic, uh, hydrophilic head. So that actually, um, they function similarly as SDS, but after the solubilizing proteins, so uh, we can measure in the pro, uh, you know you know in the mass spectrometry. This allows us to be able to identify uh, membrane proteins like the many in the mitochondria and also in the electrical transport chain. And uh, uh, we be able to, um, you know, actually get more phosphorus in you know, the membrane protein and also uh, ATP synthesis. Uh, so this is another study Timothy has that uh, he shown this is uh, like ultra fast and reproduce proteomics for small amount of samples by um, by this photo photo cleaver surfactant and a new mass spectrometer called Tim's Top Pro, and it was uh, just thirty minutes of uh, you know uh, digestion from one milligram samples. You can um, right now identify and quantify four thousand proteins. 
We also uh, start to integrate the proteomics with metabolomics called Motaomics. This is nice work by my students, Elizabeth Spain. So if you're interested, you can take a look at our publication. Um, so for proteins, uh, you know, to identify in the blood, uh, as we know that the, the blood, right, it's a, a low, it's difficult to identify the low bonded proteins because of albumin. So we take a nanoproteomics approach that uh, we use nanoparticles that we can enrich these low bonded proteins. And then actually, um, at the same time we enrich the troponin I, we also de deplete, I mean, <laughs> the albumin. So allow us to, to really see the cardiac troponin I. And uh, these are from a healthy individual, these um, from, uh, you know, disease samples, the postmortem. So our goal is to develop this uh, components of a troponin assay that for precision medicine, as you know, the traditional method of troponin I is rely on antibodies, but sometimes there are uh, uh, a lot of issues that now we have much higher resolution and we provide a molecular level fingerprints and hopefully this can be used for you know for clinicians for better diagnosis of patients and in conclusion i show you that um you know we try to integrate the omics and function for kind of systems biology at the minute we still we still you know in in, in the beginning we still try to to do better integration and uh, i'm very happy to learn from uh, all of uh, you know my colleagues and in cardiology and physiology and uh, of course um we, we we try to um bring everybody together to 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 really establish this uh, system biology approach so we show this type of podium mix for precision medicine we can take patient samples to uh, take a sample, the tissue, blood, um, clinical samples, uh, measure proteomics using pretium and expression changes, integrated markers. We can segregate patients for personalized uh, treatment. We can also use uh, the patient's blood samples to reprogram a PSL, differentiate in cardiomyocytes and in the ECT to, to really uh, test uh, the drug. So to um, highlight this review by uh, Jo, jo and uh, Saeed and uh, uh, who now has his own lab. So uh, the, these patients with IPSLs, I, I will say is certainly has a, a bright future for drug discovery, um, you know, disease modeling and regeneration. So I'd like to thank my group. I have very talented trainees, excellent students and the postdocs. Um, you know, um, thanks to funding and also, you know, thanks to my collaborators. Uh, you know, medicine is a beautiful place and uh, we do look for, you know, uh, trainees. Uh, we have uh, uh, graduate students and uh, postdoc positions available. So particularly call for biology students anyway with cardiac biology um, background uh, interested in proteomics, please uh, contact me. Okay, and last slide, whoops, is to welcome all of you <laughs> to Madison. It's a really beautiful city. We have a, a really beautiful, pro, you know, like a program and uh, we're gonna have a rooftop dinner and a lot of activities. So welcome you all to join us on June 20, 27th, 30th. Okay, I'm down with it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Let's Thank see. you. Thank you, Ian. That was that was really a great talk. Um, I, so there's a number of questions here in the Q and A box. So I'll read them to you, and you can just focus on answering them. All right. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So the first question here um, from Kazi Hawk says, "When you say global, do you mean all these developmental changes in protein expression is are homogenous throughout the heart? What about chain chamber specificity or transmural changes?" Um, would you expect there to be different or similar changes in other parts of the ventricle or in the atria? No, that's a great question. I want to clarify the global means like the entire proteome, not the whole heart. We actually, on this study, we only look at uh, left ventricle. Uh, so likely atria, you know, I mean, there will be have similar um trends but we we you know since we have not performed the study and uh, uh, but it, it's kind of in, it will be interesting to actually look at different chambers and so again this is a communication so 
we will um, need to do a more uh, comprehensive study. So this is a good question. We, I might put that into my proposal to <laughs> look at a different, you know, the section transmural and uh, chamber differences. All right. Uh, the next is uh, actually from two. Uh, one was an anonymous question. The other one was from uh, Bruce Allen. Basically, uh, a lot of the dis a lot of the examples that you gave for the top down uh, approaches are relatively high abundance proteins. How well uh, do low abundance proteins such as protein kinases, transcriptional regulators, how well are they detected? Um, and would you, if you wanted to go after those, would you have to reduce the complexity of the sample to be able to analyze such targets? Uh, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, we, um, yes, we always say, I focus on sarcomere, so it is also, luckily, it's a highly abundant protein. <laughs> so, um, so uh, it's, a, I would say, you know, low abundant protein, we are starting to look at them, right, the kinases. So, because they are low abundance, so you, you, you know, you're struggling with, uh, like, detection because it's, it's like we always say you play basketball with Yao Ming, somebody really tall, right? You cannot get a ball. So we have to separate low abundant proteins with high abundant proteins using multidimensional chromatography, which we are now developing in the lab to try to, you know, to use different uh, chromatography separation. Uh, for, for your proteins, extremely low expression level, uh, we actually do the, uh, we call the you know, um, as I said, you can either use immune affinity enrichment or in our method, we use uh, the, the nano proteomics. We are developing these uh, nano particles that we actually try targeting the kinases of phosphate. It's ongoing research. <laughs> we have, we, it's, uh, yes, we, we are trying to uh, work on those low abundant proteins. But it certainly it's it's more difficult. But again, um, when I first submitted my first R one, you know, my uh, I got a great suggestion from the uh, from the study section member to focus, and luckily I focused on sarcomere, <laughs> so which is more abundant proteins. Um, I have a, a tons of fun working uh, on the sarcomere proteins, and I love my sarcomere community. In yeah. <laughs> well, I, I might I might be biased, but I definitely think <laughs> that you picked the right one to focus on. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but definitely those other uh, proteins are very, very critical. We, are, we, we will work on them. Actually, we are working on that. <laughs> We're going to show very nice data. So. <laughs> um, XJ Wong asked, uh, so you actually did address this a little bit later on, um, but the examples that you showed for the top-down approaches tended to be smaller proteins. How does the size of the protein affect the accuracy of the top-down technique? So the size of protein so far up to um, 200 uh, kilodalton protein, we actually, it's, uh, we'll be able to get pretty good accuracy. Uh, uh, we have not seen protein like Titan. Actually, I did not uh, show this data. Um, that, we, you know, my students have shown the mycin heavy chain and light chain. They actually get pretty good coverage and the mass accuracy. So uh, this recent study um, by uh, um, my, my student, Jake Melby, so he actually has shown this um, mycin heavy chain, 200, uh, you know, 23 kilodalton, he has been able to plus minus one, plus minus two dalton. So it's pretty, pretty accurate, I would say. But again, we we have not tried to analyze Titan. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's a different story. Mm -hmm. I think so far for um, proteins, um, you know, below, I mean, about 200 kD, we should be able to get good accuracy. Yeah, well, to be fair, Titan's a different story for any approach. <laughs> I know. Uh, Titan itself is a whole proteome, pretty yeah. much, <laughs> the mega dog. So I think those of you working on Titan, like Hanko, others are just very brief. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's very important. For mass spec, it's just so, it's just very challenging. Uh, so the last question we have here is from Manuela Zocolo, which is, uh, 
you you show beautiful data um, for a decrease in uh, troponin I phosphorylation in ischemic cardiomyopathy. Do you see the same reduction for other myofilament protein PKA targets like uh, myosin binding protein C, uh, for example? <laughs> So um, for that study, the ICM study, we only use 1D. So uh, we have not used 2D, so, but we are now working on 2D to show my mycin binding protein C is a bigger size protein. So we actually cannot detect them in the one dimensional chromatography. You can detect them in 2D. Uh, two-dimensional chromatography. Uh, so again, we are working on that now. And likely, you can see the similar kind of trend in the decreased phosphorylation, but we have not. We, we are working on it now. And again, Titan is a different story. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know when we will be able to look at Titan, but, you know, probably use a middle down, you know, kind of cut into smaller pieces, like a, a, a hundred kilodalton might be manageable right now. It's, Megadalton, it's a, it's a still going to be a, a challenge, but certainly it's doable. It's possible, I would say. I want to encourage those young people in the audience. If you are, you know, interested in challenging problems, you're welcome to our lab and we can work together. If you're interested in Titan, let's start working together and tackling the problem of Titan. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions you have in the, in the Q&A mm -hmm. box. I have a whole list of questions, um, but since we're out of time, I'm going to ask you one question, which is, will you just come down to Loyola and give a seminar so we can have a whole conversation? Great. All <laughs> sure. Right, all right. It's, uh, a, it, it's, email a, invitation. it's a short drive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a Loyola when Saki was there. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, been, it's been too long then, so I'll send you an invite. Well, thank you very much for uh, that exciting talk. Um, and thank you for all the uh, attendees uh, and the uh, robust questions that we had. That was great. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. And uh, thank you, Ron, for hosting the section. And again, thanks to the JMCC editors, John, uh, Ron Tian and uh, uh, Mike Ragnia for giving us this great opportunity. It's a very big honor to be editor of choice. <laughs> so thank you.